All right. Well, welcome everyone to the None of Our Businesses show and podcast. Uh, here with me today is Prem Kumar, who is up in Seattle. I'm coming to you here from Portland, Oregon. So welcome, Prem. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. And I'll tell you all a little bit about Prem real quick. Prem is the CEO and founder of Humanly, an AI platform that qualifies job candidates and answers their questions along the way. Before launching his own company, Prem led the product management and design teams at Tiny Pulse, which is an employee engagement company that empowers organizations to build world-class cultures with real-time people data. Uh, Prem also spent a decade working with Microsoft in various product capacities, and he's been blogging for the Society of Human Resource Management for the last five years. So with that uh, brief introduction, I want to kind of start with just a, a, a broad um, open question um, and not even a question, just uh, tell us about tell us about the company. Tell us about Humanly and what it does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we use AI to screen and schedule job candidates at scale. So right now about 60 hours are being spent manually um, uh, reading through resumes, um, scheduling candidates, going back and forth on the phone. So our goal is to automate that. Um, and then the other piece of it is around candidate experience. So over 50% of candidates have a negative experience right now across the board in the US. Um, our goal is to make that experience better. And what's what's happening now is the ones that are having a negative experience, about 72% of them, according to a Glassdoor study, will write about that online. So they'll go on Facebook, they'll go on Glassdoor, they'll tell their friends. So employer brand is really suffering. So really saving time at the top of the recruiting funnel and then creating a better candidate experience um, is what we're focused on. Yeah, and I think that's that's really interesting because um, the focus on the candidate experience and, and and how it affects them is something that I didn't anticipate when first kind of hearing about your company. So I think that's a that's a great um, uh, angle on the product. Uh, so do you have at this point? Do you have data that that gives you any feedback on whether um, the candidates are having a good experience uh, using the platform and how that affects whether they potentially leave negative reviews for the company? Yeah, so so right now we have every candidate, whether they um, pass the screen, got the job um, or not, um, rate our bot conversation. So right now it's about uh, averaging around 4.8 or 4.9 out of 5. So it was really interesting to actually see when we're looking at people that are being told they're not a good fit, but yet they're still rating the experience high. That was actually really interesting for us to see. Um, and what happens is right now the average job in the U.S., it's 150 resumes, and the ones we're targeting are, are high-volume roles, so 200 resumes, 300 resumes. One person gets a job, and then the rest of the 299 people are left to kind of float around, never to be talked to again. Um, but what we're seeing is there's a big opportunity, opportunity for companies to turn all of those um, candidates, all the 300 candidates, into maybe future customers, future hires, um, and brand advocates. So that, that's a missed opportunity right now that we're trying to solve for. Wow, that's fantastic. So when it comes to bots, um, bots to me are just one um, delivery mechanism or one channel by wh which you can interact with candidates. So this is like a something that pops up on your jobs page or um, something that maybe is delivered um, in, in other uh, places on the web and it will ask candidates questions, answer their questions. Um, what we're really finding is, um, and where we try and provide value is it. Um, bots are one way to deliver the content, but we want to be where, wherever candidates are engaging. Um, so that includes, uh, you know, text messaging. That includes um, a, a bunch of other forms. Um, and what we're finding is there's um, a lot of research around wh whether candidates want to talk to a bot or not. Um, so there is an article by VentureBeat that said, um, or maybe it was, I think it was VentureBeat that said about 60% of people would talk to a bot if they if they felt it would get them answers quicker. And I think um, I, I think most people would say if answers come quicker that they would talk to a piece of technology. Um, but there's really been a trust issue because I think in the past um, there's been mistakes made in in how technology is used and really bridging that gap between uh, between technologies and humans. Yeah, I, I'm smiling about this because it, I was thinking about in relating to my own life, my wife loves talking to her gadgets. So yeah. she likes, she's got them all. She has Siri, Alexa, Google. And yeah. She, yeah. <laughs> she loves talking to all of them. And so do you, is there, a, you think there's a correlation in that research? Be, I mean, is it the same kind of thing that the people who 
uh, are into that kind of thing are more likely to be okay with or enjoy talk, working with the bots? Yeah, it, it's a good question. So generally, um, I would say like a couple of years ago was mainly folks that um, were, were kind of um, adept to those type of technologies, like your wife or, or like myself, I fit in that same category. Um, but what we're finding is people are getting more and more comfortable, um, particularly, you know, in some scenarios like support, it's a little harder because um, conversations can be very open ended and all of a sudden you're asking a question and the bot just keeps repeating itself. Um, and in candidate screening, it's a you consistency is good. So you want to be asking each candidate the same set of questions. So that's um, so I think it's easier to have more high quality conversations there. So if you can get to a certain quality level, we have found that. Um, most people actually, um, not just the the ones that are maybe more savvy, um, um, are are happy to have that interaction. And and really, it's it's not about replacing the person, but getting them to the right person quicker. So if we can prove out that, hey, you're a top candidate, we know you want to get to the next step in the process. Um, here's a quicker way to do that versus um, you know again throwing your resume over the fence. Mm -hmm. Is there a component to this that is? Um... I'm thinking from a legal standpoint, it, it occurred to me as you were talking about the consistency in questions that it that it maybe improves the the um, the lack of bias or discrimination or or how does it relate to bias or discrimination? Let me just yeah. ask it openly that way. Yeah. So really good question. So there's a lot of legal stuff and then there's a lot of um, maybe not legal, but more ethical stuff. So um, one thing that's really prevalent right now when entry level recruiters that maybe had not a ton of training are, are interfacing with candidates, um, as well as when people are doing reference checks, is it's very common for them to ask questions around you know, protected class status and things that, that are actually illegal to, to ask people about um, sexual orientation, things like that. So what we find is a lot of, um, a, a lot, there's a lot of that stuff happening right now. And, and the good thing about technology and bots is you can make it consistent and you can make it so that those never come up um, right. from like a bias standpoint. So I, I think one piece is just creating a, a level playing field and being accessible everywhere. Um, there's some people that I think are getting this wrong. So there's um, AI that's being used in in video interviewing. And um, so, so basically um, saying that, hey, this candidate's better than that candidate based on an algorithm um, that's used on, like you and I are talking on video here. Um, we did a lot of interviews and we found that, you know, folks with autism or folks that are blind, um, we talked to a particular guy who's blind and he just can't apply to jobs that, strictly use that video, um, the, the AI to discern whether they hire someone based on the video because he can't control his hand gestures as much. And, um, you know, his, his um, obviously being blind, he's not making eye contact. And, and some technologies are using things like eye contact and stuff like that to say, hey, this candidate's better than that. And, and there's a lot of great technologies that are doing video. So I'm not saying it's um, always bad to do um, use AI in video interviewing, but um, but yeah, there is a lot of bias at play. So I think it starts with it being accessible. Um, and some of it's even just the words that are used. Um, some candidates will, um, if they're being asked a set of questions that maybe offend them, they're less likely to proceed in the process. Um, there is a zip recruiter study that um, about around 70% of job descriptions in the US use um, male uh, gendered words, um, and if they just made it neutral, you get about 45% or so more applicants applying. So lots of things in the wording, um, the words do matter, um, and then just in the accessibility of it all. That, uh, when you talk about um, some people using the AI technology with video and trying to read body language, it reminds me of, I don't know if you've uh, read a recent book by Malcolm Gladwell, um, which was uh, talking to strangers, and I've, got, yeah, I've heard that, yeah, I've heard yeah, that. And, and and he talks, he, he basically discusses this exact issue about that um, actually, as human beings, we're terrible about uh, about how we <laughs> how we read body language and the assumptions that we make based on it, and how it goes wrong more often than not in terms of uh, in terms of we think we know things about people by just listening to the way they say things and looking at their body language and and we often uh can really misinterpret and lead to some disastrous situations yeah absolutely i, I do want to i got to get that on my reading list that that malcolm gladwell book but yeah you know they say a lot of a lot of communication um happens uh 
outside of, of what you're saying um, with, with body language and whatnot, but if you interpret those wrong, um, and, and sometimes if you're having machines try and interpret that, it could get even worse, perhaps. But. Yeah, I wish I could remember. He had some, he had some terminologies for it, but, it, but the, that, that some people don't have the, they don't have a match between how their body language and what they're actually thinking or saying is. And so, yeah, interesting book. I would totally recommend it for, for as it relates to this particular field. Yeah, that's great. Um, so what, what, what inspired you to build a business in this particular space? Um, so I've been kind of in the, in HR technology for a while. So when, when I was at Microsoft, um, I, I was the PM for HR portal for a while, really just, um, interested in solving problems, people problems with data and technology. So been in kind of a lot of those HR technology type spaces, went to a company called Tiny Pulse, like you mentioned in the intro that focused on employee engagement and, and culture. One thing I saw at Tiny Pulse though is um, uh, it, culture really starts with hiring in a lot of ways and who, who you bring in, who the people are. So um, a lot of uh, customers that I talked to that were Tiny Pulse customers had pain points around hiring. Um, so that really, I felt that there's a technology that evolved to a point where it can be very helpful in some ways and, and you know, getting that right candidate to the right recruiter, making the experience better. Um, so, and then also just my own experience as a candidate. I, I remember when I was graduating from college, I I really wanted to work at, I'll call them big software company X. And um, I applied there and, you know, I told my family I was going to be moving to California and I was really excited. I put tons of time into my resume, my cover letter, and I just never heard anything back, not even an automated response. And, um, you know, over time, you kind of just get used to it because that's how application processes kind of work. But I feel they can be a lot better than that. Um. Are there competitors for, I mean, I guess you did mention that some people are getting into the video AI. So what does that competitive landscape look like? And yeah. what's your advantage in, in, in the space? Absolutely, and I, I love talking about our competitors because I, I, I like where things are going generally. And I think there's gonna be a lot of great companies that, that emerge in this space. So um, generally, so there's a lot of tools that do applicant tracking. We're more on the interacting, not the tracking piece. Um, so. You know, one of the buzzy words is conversational hiring, conversational recruiting. Um, so one, one company that I consider the leader in this space on the enterprise side is a company Maya. Actually, and Zor. Those are those are kind of three of the ones that and there's there's several others, but those are three of the ones that we've been tracking. Um, the the main way we differentiate is we're really targeting um, for the most part mid market. Um, so companies that um, that want that need to deploy this super fast that might not have the resources that larger companies have, um, and what we're also trying to do is we want to make this we want to build the world's kind of largest library of this conversational content. So if you are hiring a JavaScript engineer in Seattle that speaks Spanish, here is the template to here's the bot to deploy or here's the conversation to deploy. So it's almost like we're training up, instead of training up a team of 20 recruiters at a company, we're training up a team of 10,000 bots and, and, and whatnot um, that can be used by multiple companies at once. I'm going to pause this for a second. I'm getting some strange feedback here. I don't... No, no problem. Okay, go ahead and pick it up. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, seems seems like it's okay now. Okay, so <clears throat> how are you going about uh, finding and attracting customers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we started with kind of an outbound sales motion, so going out cold calling, um, emailing, um, finding out what messages really resonate. Um, the messages that we're finding that do resonate are time savings is one candidate experience and then the third is around bias and, and diversity and eliminating bias um so we're, we're now going to be actually doing a little bit more content marketing to get leads coming inbound so updating our website um, maybe it'll be updated by the time this uh, the, the podcast goes live um we're uh, going to be um, doing more content with our blog um, really trying to drive quali qualified leads inbound um but yeah up to now it's mainly been um outbound sales, inside sales. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and then another, another thing I'll mention too is just partnerships. So we haven't gone deep into that yet, but building out kind of channel partnerships with, there's a lot of technologies kind of solving different parts of the puzzle. So there's a tool called Good Time that does just interview scheduling and, and some other things, but they come a little bit further down the process from us. So that could be a good partner. Um, but, but yeah, partnerships are another way that we can help get customers. Mm -hmm. What, what does your team look like at this point? Do you have employees or you work with contractors? Um, how are you getting it done? Yeah, so we're a team of about seven. So we, we have, um, I have a couple co-founders and then we have some employees, um, mainly uh, so sales, engineering, um, we hired a designer. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we are using, um, you know, contracting out certain things. Um, so we're using Upwork to, uh, you're talking about selling. Um, so to get uh, leads um, and, and lists of leads. So we'll have someone go in, um, go through LinkedIn, see who's hiring, find find um, lists of leads for us that we can then call up. Um, so yeah, um, in design, we actually um, originally were contracting that out, but design to me is just so important in building that brand and, and making the, the product really, really stick. Um, so we now have someone that's, um, um, right now part-time that we'll eventually hire full-time. I see. So um, with with a team of that size, is company culture a consideration for you? Yeah, absolutely. So, and, you know, coming from Tiny Pulse and really working with, um, you know, thousands of clients that um, of different sizes that, that were investing in their culture, I, I really saw, felt that it is. And the way I kind of think about culture is, and, and size of company is, you know, culture really is kind of the ethos of your organization and it's always growing. So um, for us to hire people, um, we don't necessarily want to hire people that are exactly like us. We kind of, what we want to do is look at what our vision is right now, where we want to be in three years and kind of build that culture roadmap. So I think right now it's really important um, and there's things we're doing to measure engagement. Um, but I think it's just like you're planning a product roadmap or just like you're planning, you know, your company vision over time, it's important to um, start with culture in day one and then think about about how it, how it evolves over time. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, why did you decide after leaving Tiny Pulse to kind of be the be the entrepreneur and start your own company as opposed to joining another team? Yeah, so um, if you look so I think I've always kind of been an entrepreneur at heart. So you couldn't tell that by looking at my resume because I was at Microsoft for, you know, 10 years. Um, but I always sought out kind of entrepreneur type roles within Microsoft. So teams that were emerging, um, new projects. Um, so I've, I've always kind of had that um, really enjoyed the, the, you know, starting from zero, getting from zero to one. Um, when I, so I had that in mind and I was trying to be planful about how I, I got to that goal. Um, so I took the job at Tiny Pulse. Um, they obviously weren't at, weren't at zero. They had been around for a while when I joined and, and were getting really good traction. Um, but it was a good way for me to kind of dip my toe in, understand kind of how, how startups work, um, and then eventually uh, go out and do my own thing. So I think it's, it's, you know, if you talk to my friends, they'd probably say I've been talking about this for like 10 years, but, but uh, about starting my own company. So it's always kind of been a, an ambition of mine. Mm -hmm. um. And so, how how is it different now that you're a business owner from when you uh, were an employee? I mean, if you maybe compare it all the way back to when you were at Microsoft, it sounds like that was more kind of classic working on a team as an employee. Um, what what are the differences in terms of challenges or benefits? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one challenge is you don't have that that kind of clout. So it's harder to, to get meetings with, with customers, to get conference speaking engagements. Um, uh, so I, I think, you know, in Microsoft, it was it, a lot of that was fed to you. You kind of had that that infrastructure and that brand. Um, so here you're, you're starting from scratch. Um, we do find that, you know, from a customer standpoint, some a lot of customers actually like working with, you know, a scrappy startup that is going to, you know, be there in, in, in person, walk through their problems with them and not somebody that, 
you know, they, they never have time with. So I think kind of playing to the, the strengths we do have, which is, um, you know, we're small so we can move fast. We can really make sure we're really delighting our customers and, and not having customers be, um, you know, lost um, in, you know, a sea of, of thousands of other clients. Um, so I think, yeah, servicing customers uh, is something that I found we have advantages in um, as a small company, um, you know, getting customers and, and having the the brand values is something that we, we don't have as much here, of course, as as I did at Microsoft. Yeah, makes sense. That that reminds me, I in my days when I was a manager at PricewaterhouseCoopers in a small city like Portland, yep. um, that was the sensibility was, well, if I call up the accounting department of any particular uh, uh, company in town, the, I, I'm likely to get through and I'm likely to be able to get a lunch or a coffee or something on the calendar, particularly if I'm going to, particularly if I'm setting it up for one of our partners uh, at, at the firm or whatever. And and then after, after leaving that and working with uh, being a partner in a smaller uh, local public accounting firm, and then now in my consulting business as it is, yeah, I, I feel that exact same thing. It's like it, it's it's not a slam dunk that you can get in front of the people that you want to get in front of. There's a little more work to it, so <laughs> I totally understand that. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one of the things I have to ask, being an accountant, is how do you do your accounting? How does that how does that part of your process get done? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and. Um, I, I, it doesn't get done in, in efficient ways right now. So we're we're relying on you know advisors that um, you know or CPAs, and we only have a certain amount of time from them. Um, so it's really just uh, um, yeah, it's definitely something we're we're interested in, in 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 finding out how we can get nailed down more efficiently um, working with experts because yeah, it's extremely important. Um, you know, we want to use our cash as an asset and make sure that we're um, you know. Right now, we're basically just checking off all the boxes to make sure we're compliant, but we're not, um, you know, as strategic as we'd like to be. And, and we are finding that there's even at our stage, uh, there's significant need to to work with professionals on on things like accounting. So, yeah, I, I guess the jury's still out, but um, we, we need to figure that out. <laughs> Have you? Do you do anything unique in terms of your accounting? In terms of an accounting platform, or are you using kind of the well, the the hallmark? software is to use QuickBooks, for example. Are you doing that or are you doing something, uh, something a road less traveled? We're, we're using QuickBooks, yeah, yeah. We're using QuickBooks right now. Um, and mainly my, my co-founder is managing that, but, but yeah, that, that's what we're using right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, what's next for Humanly then? What, uh, what do you, where do you see the company, say, in the next 12 months? And what might that look like even in terms of headcount? Yeah, so we just got um, done uh, raising a, a, a kind of tranche of investment money, and we're gonna, um, you know, starting right now, we're beginning to to make announcements around that. Um, we're gonna be doing a little bit more PR next month. Um, as far as headcount, um, we'll probably be at about 15 people by the end of the year. Um, you know, our our goal is to to move as fast as possible and and grow um, really uh, do it growing by way of creating awesome experiences for our customers. So. You know, one customer at customer at a time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I you know, one of the from a product standpoint, like I mentioned before, that this is really a, you know, a data and content thing. We want to build that that library of, of conversations to make hiring just so much easier. Um, it's really tough right now, and even if you do train up a recruiter to be uh, really strong, most recruiters leave after a little over a year anyway. So. Um, we, we do feel there's a big opportunity for companies to to build that hiring brand to save a bunch of time at the top of the funnel and then turn every candidate into a you know a potentially a future candidate a customer an advocate so yeah. something you something you were saying there um, inspired kind of a different a different question for me um, on the technical side and uh, it relates to something that I had read before that that I didn't I didn't know, but what I've heard is that um, when you're building AI platforms, that the data is really important because, and, and the amount of data that you can work with can be very important um, depending on how you develop the platform. Is that a consideration for you? I, I guess my question is, yeah. do you expect that the more data you have, the better the platform becomes? Yeah, absolutely. So there's kind of two parts of, um, you know, as we think of building out these conversations and kind of the the art and science behind it there's a certain piece of the conversation that um 
a bot may have with the candidate that it's um, predetermined, um, that's um, you know multiple choice or deterministic, and then there's more open-ended pieces of it. And the open-ended piece of it, the bot will get better and better, but whether it's a bot or whether it's um, showing up in it as a different form, but it'll get better and better with, with more interaction. So having that training data um, is super important. Um, and, and one thing we're trying to do is not be a purely uh, you know, unstructured AI platform, we're doing a lot with um, kind of the more deterministic piece of it as well, so that even before we have the data, we can create a, a great experience. It's not like, um, you know, our, our technology will not be, if it's not able to answer a question, we, we're trying to be really good at what what that looks like, what the experience looks like in the cases that that it's not um, answering the question correctly. But yes, the, the data piece is huge. And there's, there's tools out there. Um, there's one I think called scale.ai where you can actually um, begin to play with large sets of data even if you haven't acquired them yourselves from your clients. Um, and, and that also makes me think of, you know, data privacy is just so important to us. Um, when you were talking about competitive advantages, that's another area that, that we're really um, placing a ton of effort into to make sure that from a privacy and security standpoint, um, especially in this day and age, that customers know exactly how we're using their data and that we're we're not using it in ways that they didn't sign up for. And what I mean by that is we're using it to make their experience better, not to uh, make other people's experiences better. Um, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh perhaps a geopolitical question for you. Um, I think along those same lines, one of the things I read is that China is potentially positioned to basically kick our butt here in the US when it comes to AI development because they uh, they have a, a centralized plan and program for uh, how to deploy data and, and build out AI technology. Is that, I'd love to hear kind of being somebody that's actually in this industry, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. If you've, if you've heard that or uh, thought about that or if that's a consideration at all. Yeah, I mean, d definitely from like a data volume standpoint. Um, and, and as you mentioned, like the Chinese government actually investing in, in AI and, and there's a lot of stuff our government does around that as well. Um, you know, it, it is in in some ways almost an arms race in the sense that you know the faster you get more data, the more more efficient you'll be. Um, one thing I'm seeing, and not to like call out any any specific countries, but I think mainly from like a company standpoint, the ones that are focusing more on the the customer experience, what that end to end experience looks like, and how data can solve those problems versus starting from you know how do we get the most data and then then we'll kind of plug it in to to help customers. So I think is the the countries, the products, the technologies, and the companies that start with the customer and don't start with the data, I think are are the ones that are going to win. Um, you know AI and and you know machine learning and stuff are really just ways of solving problems, but you have to understand the problem first before you throw technology at it. So, Sure. Yeah, this was a super interesting topic. I think our audience is going to really enjoy and appreciate kind of uh, hearing your uh, your thoughts on, on these things that we discussed today. Well, thank you. And to our audience, um, uh, we'll see you in the next uh, segment. All right. Thanks. Hello and welcome back to the None of Our Businesses podcast and YouTube show. And we are doing our panel discussion. Uh, sometimes I call it AKA the round table. And we have uh, AJ here and Charlie. And uh, we're gonna get right into it with a couple of articles today. All right. So uh, the article I found to talk about today was from MIT. And it is a, an article about how a model beats Wall Street analysts in forecasting business financials. Um, so what they're doing is they're taking alternate data is what they call it, but they take credit card statement data that they buy from people who run credit cards. And then they use that data to try to correlate it with earnings reports that are publicly available. And then they look for correlations that are um, what they call noisy, where the correlations aren't 100% perfect. But they find that this um, data is able is useful to predict how the actual companies are going to do, even though they're focusing in on only an excerpt of what that company's total revenue stream looks like. 
And so it's kind of counterintuitive because uh, it's a very small part of, of everything that that company does. But because that data is, uh, instead of just being at a point in time, like at the end of a quarter, at the end of a month, which is what's traditionally available in publicly available financial statements, it's um, ongoing. So it's like they have pieces of data for every day. And so I wanted to talk about it, one, from the standpoint of I think it's interesting to try to use something tertiary to predict what's going to happen in, uh, in you know, revenue or in reports. But also, I think it's kind of an interesting ethical question of whether or not that credit card information or something that you would think would be your own information is, you know, being bought and sold and then used to predict these things and then used to predict them even more accurately than uh, traditional Wall Street analysts. So it's actually a pretty accurate um, system. And so, yeah, I just want to get your guys' take on, did you know this was happening or have you ever heard of this before, this alternate data? No. It kind of makes sense. I think just to clarify the point, we're talking about the credit card data we're referring to is on the sales side. So it's a company's uh, revenue or sales receipts that are going through credit cards yep. that, is, that we're talking about. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, yeah, it kind of makes sense. I wonder though, I wonder if the predictive value depends on the industry. Like, uh, like you would expect maybe an e-commerce company may have more predictive value based on the based on the credit card sales than an industry where credit card sales is a minority of of how they actually collect their revenue? I don't know. I don't think you're giving AI enough credit here. And this is another example of AI stealing our jobs. <clears throat> and I think we need to really rally behind these poor, unfortunate Wall Street forecasters that are going to be without jobs here soon. That's, I mean, that's, this that's is a my drown, whole reason for bringing it listen, up. This is a drown trotten group that needs to be <laughs> brought up by their bootstraps. Yes. No, I, I'm just kidding, though. But what's funny is I everybody's acting like this is kind of new but I've heard of you know predictive AI stuff like this and mining public data way back in like 2010 I don't know if anybody remembers the target story where the father had like a young teenage daughter and was getting <clears throat> prenatal care and coupons for like you know like she was pregnant right yeah. and he furiously calls up target and it's like my you know, my daughter's not pregnant, quit sending us all this stuff. But it turns out she was pregnant and through a through research of the stuff or, you know, I guess through AI and machine learning through the stuff that she was buying from Target, Target inferred she was pregnant before the parents knew she was actually pregnant. Yeah. Big increase in pickle purchases and stuff yeah. like that. Well, it was something about vitamins, too. Like, yeah. she had a cocktail of prenatal vitamins that she was taking, so obviously she knew she was pregnant, but they knew then because of that cocktail of vitamins that she was you know, uh, taking them for the purpose of a, of a child. So it, I think it's just an increase in that and, and shows like the power behind what AI can do. Where I think usually people think of financial forecasting like this as kind of like a magic cauldron of, you know, like it's almost like a Vegas bet or like a betting line in Vegas where a group of guys get together and they kind of see what, what line's gonna move the needle on the bets. <clears throat> where financial analysts kind of go in and they look at historical data and then they kind of extrapolate that out to then see what they're projecting, you know, based on internal, what the internal people are saying and then what those quarterly reports are and then the market as a whole and they kind of aggregate that all down, not by hand anymore, but with the help of computer tools. But at the end of the day, it's usually somebody looking over it and, and analyzing it. And I think you're going to see that switch and just like in our industry, you'll see it switch to where the machine will be doing most of the most of the calculations and the and the aggregation of it, <clears throat> and a human will just be there to look at this output that it spits yeah. out and kind of interpret that. Well, I think um, I, the part that I I guess the part that I missed is how. How, how is it that the public would get access to this data? It's well, it's not the public. So what happens is that the target, as they run credit cards, will then sell the information off the credit cards they ran to a third party who's using it for this purpose. So I see. It's, it's to contrast against publicly available financial statements that are, are made to be shared, but they're taking this piece of private data that they've bought and using it to project. Well, here's what's interesting about that, though, is so... Target sells credit card data to a third party. What's the company that is being analyzed? And is it Target? It's it's on a variety of companies, but in this example, I'm choosing Target. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
when you think about it, it's kind of like turning it back on the company itself, right? Because the I, I suspect that Target doesn't sell their credit card data for that purpose. They sell it because of the other data, the other side of the transaction data is what they think they're selling, right? Is what I would assume. <laughs> they're, they're not selling like, or maybe they're selling like information that's just volumes of certain kinds of consumer goods that are being purchased. I guess there's data there that they have that, that might be interesting. Because what I think about on that is like, the company itself has this kind of information because uh, I would think because that they probably have the ability. Now you've worked you've worked in e-commerce and and dealt with credit card processing a bit, so you can tell me if I'm wrong. But I mean, w wouldn't a company be able to go into the the banking or the credit card website at certain times of the month and find out what the revenue stream was? Yeah, they can throughout. get their own. So yeah, so yeah, it's not the information's existence and the is not is not really the. The existence of the information is not as groundbreaking as the sale. who has the yeah, information. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The interesting thing here is the fact that they're taking that and selling it, and then util, you know, turning that into a revenue stream for themselves. Right, right, and yeah, and it, I, I, the curious part from my standpoint is when Target started, when Target or we're using Target because I was an example, but it could be any of these companies, right? When they start selling credit card information to third parties. Were they anticipating that that was the use, or were they anticipating some other use? And because the because I don't know, there's a cynical side of me that's like sometimes we, there's this game being played by inside management versus outside analysts, where inside management always kind of knows more than outside analysts, and they don't necessarily they're not yet necessarily looking for ways to give outside analysts more information. And surely to that point, they could have right. I mean, they could have they could have it would have probably been subject to some kind of SEC issue, but they, they could have come up with a system of disclosing their credit card data in a way to be used uh, by analysts of their company um, in the past if that's what they wanted to do. So it's, I guess what I'm getting at, what seems um, kind of ironic about it to some extent is consumers, consumers, consumer advocate groups have been upset by companies like Target selling credit card information but to some extent, Target's management selling the credit card information is actually being pointed back against them now. Yes. Right? That, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're selling, they're, they're selling it, and then external analysts are actually using that to make evaluations of Target itself, which I kind of feel like probably wasn't what they wanted. That wasn't what they were selling it for. I guess it all depends on how mm -hmm. much they're getting mm -hmm. versus what the impact of having that be available was. You know, what, and what, damage did that do to their valuation versus what were they able to capitalize on so to that selling point, it. So I guess to that point, if they actually intended to <laughs> provide information to the market about their company by selling their credit card information, is that an SEC issue? <laughs> like, right. you know, at what, right. you know, that, that, you're right. I mean, so I see, yeah, yeah. Cause it's, you know, providing information, providing that kind of public information, the way it's disclosed to it's disclosed to particularly, yeah, it's providing information that's not widely available to the public to certain parties based on a fee. Um, yeah. So you have to assume that they didn't intend to do that. And so, yeah, this may be, that'd be interesting to see if this may be an issue that the SEC actually does get into at some point. If companies are selling credit card information, which can be used in the valuation process of a company, of a public company, then they're, it, it's basically a way for them to provide inside information about what's going on in the company. What I'm wondering, I don't know, it probably doesn't, of course, probably it's uh, private, whatever. It's whoever the company is with the algorithm for the AI. Sure. It's, you know, their trade secret on how they're using this. But I'm wondering if we're looking at it too granularly and it wasn't a macro look at like, oh, spending's up in like home improvement or home goods and the aggregate data of that, of sales information, not just particularly from one store. Although I don't know how you buy and sell credit card information on the on the internet or how those big data sets are are sold. Right. And what the I guess it really depends on what the what like that granule how much granule information is available there. <clears throat> you know, per store. Yeah. Then can you see, you know, like to your point, right? Let's use Target and Walmart. Not right. that we're bagging on Target or Walmart, but use them cuz they're in similar markets or right. they're similar offerings. I was thinking the same thing, yeah. Right? To your point, yeah. 
And so, does so, the analyst only get data that is includes both right. Target and Walmart, and or then they're making they, inferences about both companies? Or, or can they view the credit card and and sales data comparatively between the two? Right. Like I know this bunch came from purchases at Walmart, and I know this bunch came from Target. Now you can compare. Well, more people are spending money at Walmart than they are at Target, or vice versa, right? right? right. Yeah. Rather yeah. than like, let's say, like a home. If you're looking at an overall macro version of of spending, right, and you're looking at Home Depot versus I don't know Lazy Boy, right? Right. Like, are people spending money on you know furniture? Are they making do? Or are they spending money on home improvement right. and right. and like you know uh, uh, evaluation? No, you know? I, I totally feel your point. I mean, using Home Depot again, like your example, it's like well. If analysts know that in the aggregate the the demand through credit card purchases for home improvement goods has gone up, then you can assume, without knowing the specific company, that Home Depot and Lowe's and other companies like that are all benefiting from it, right? So, right. so they can infer that into how they analyze those companies. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if they're if they're analyzing this by by product in the macro or the industry in the macro, or if they're analyzing it by company. I mean, they're breaking it down by company. That's the inference of the article that they're they're coming up with specific valuations of companies based on the data. But are they actually looking at the company, the data by company, is is kind of the question you're asking. Yeah, it's not yeah. clear to me from the articles, but I think it is clear that they're definitely yeah trying to find as many of those connecting factors and identify those factors like what how to spend in an entire industry compare to targets, receipts for that period. Um, and just finding as many of those connections as they can and you know utilizing them to make inferences about what they think uh, each one would do. Yeah. Well, and then it begs the question, right? One of the big things about Wall Street is the, the, the pennies on the cent, or you know, like the, the percentages of one cent that are made on transactions due to the speed of the transaction going to the market. Mm -hmm. Where there's that intermediary, you've heard about this, right? The time it takes for you to hit enter and send on your trade on a computer. It takes however many microseconds for that to reach the market to initiate a buy or sell. And then somebody in between knows that you're buying or selling. Somebody in between that can act faster, who's actually physically closer to the market, can act ahead of time and make, you know, like tenths of a cent per transaction, but if they do this a million times over the day, they make millions of dollars sure. off of this. And then there was that, you know, like I think it was Canadian people or somebody that set up uh, an alternate exchange that you could go and you wouldn't get penny swindled basically <laughs> by these trades. But the but the point was is that the people, the big boys that played with the big money had the money and the and the infrastructure to build that system that was closer to the Wall Street to make the tenths of the cents, right? right? right. And I'm wondering if we're not looking at a similar situation where you're gonna see valuations and, and earning stuff be in the hands of a few that have access to like a really expensive AI kind of system. Yeah. And then everybody exactly. else is kind of left out in the dark. You know, because yes, this stuff is isn't is. cheap and nobody's giving it away for free, you know, not like yeah. so. Yeah, that's, it's, that's interesting. Um, kind of off on a, a tangent on that point is that what a lot of what I didn't know, I, I was about to say a lot of people didn't know, but I won't I won't put my own ignorance on everyone else uh, is that um, AI and big data are intimately related because one of the ways that technologists look at solving AI problems is by just shoving an enormous amount of data toward the machine learning so that it can, it, it can basically learn from just these huge data sets and different scenarios. And so um, <clears throat> what you said that kind of inspired me on that whole point was this idea that this, the big data play, which this is in some regard, right? Is, is in the hands of just a few who have the money and infrastructure to make that play. And that I think that's totally the case. I mean, right now it's like, well, either you are an organization that already is really big and so you have your own big data, or, you are, um, or you're an organization with a lot of cash uh, that can go out and buy other people's big data. Um, and, and I think that is, when you, when you talk, I, I've, I've said this kind of thing before in these, and so people might start getting kind of a, a hint of where my political leanings might be, but I think um, 
they also might be confused or mistaken because I don't know where my own political leanings are all the time. But 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 I think it you know it it, it does circle back to this question of um, inequality and and the future of income inequality if if our world is running on AI technology and big data that is uh, that is owned by the few mm -hmm. um, and and but anyway what this made me think of was in this big guy the the idea that AI is actually uh, being uh, is related to big data that it is somewhat a big data problem is uh, there was a book and I can't remember the name of it so I'll I'll see if we can find the name and we can put it in the comments or something in the description um, of this podcast. But it was about um, a, it was like about AI, the kind of the AI wars between China and Silicon Valley, and how China's basically geared up to kick our ass on this game because mm -hmm. um, they've got a ton of data at their disposal and and they're using they have they have a program for this. They're they're using. The data from their population to kind of feed their AI development right now, um, and that that's that is their competitive advantage and in, in potentially winning the AI uh, battle against against us in the U.S. or against uh, the people in Silicon Valley. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't throw in the towel considering the amazing innovation that has come out of the U.S. and Silicon Valley. So this the problem. The problems of solving AI and big data and all that are um, are somewhat beyond me, and they're um, well, not just somewhat; they're very much beyond me. So I think there, there's a lot more to the problems than just this big data point that I'm making. But anyway, I said it would be a tangent; it's a total tangent. But <laughs> but your comment reminded me of that point and something that I thought was just interesting is the connection between big data and AI development and how china's kicking our ass on it well and just how much of it is brute forcing your way into an answer of just like utilizing exactly. so much data that you might not think is relevant but once you look at it long enough and you see enough of it you realize well a lot of things that don't seem relevant actually really are it's just a matter of finding those connections and well and i think that is going to be the next kind of big natural re not natural resource but big resource that people start pulling from and china has a massive head start on machine learning you heard yeah. about like the surveillance, like face yeah. recognition stuff yeah. and that social kind of currency that they're trading in now that's kind of like a smartphone game, uh, smartphone app slash game, but it's basically your life, you know, and who you interact with and how you socially rank up. Yeah. No, I think that I think that was the kind of the overall point of the this author that I was thinking of, or at least that's the big takeaway that I got from it is exactly what you said, but that big data was the was the current gold rush, mm -hmm. but it's really an intermediary treasure because it is the path to AI, which is the ultimate treasure. It's who's going to own the AI technology in the future, and it's and and I think what this was getting at is the people who are going to own the AI technology are the people that first owned the big data because they're the ones who had the, the they're going to have the the ones who have the data to use the brute force methodology to <laughs> essentially solve AI problems. Right. Wow, I was way down the rabbit hole on that one. From very, very down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, but these are real issues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's good to get to the bottom of them. Yeah. So I uh, want to thank you both being here as always, AJ and Charlie. And uh, to our viewers and listeners, thank you for um, joining us. And hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube and the notification icon so that you know when we've, we've got a new episode. And if you're listening on you know, Podcast Network, make sure to download us and subscribe to us so that you um, are staying up to date with our episodes as they come out weekly. Uh, so thanks again for joining us and we will see you all next time. See you next week. Thank you.